Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone back to our third and final session about how principals can support coaches and vice versa with Jim Knight. Um, at ERLC, we are so pleased to have Jim with us. Um, it's been a wonderful and valuable learning opportunity for all of us. Uh, I'd just like to mention again that um, the session has been co-developed with Jim as a result of a grant from Alberta Education to support implementation. And without further ado, um, I'll turn the mic over to Jim and we'll get our session started today. Welcome everybody on this cold, cold day and thanks Jim. I, I don't want to tell you that it's uh, about 17 degrees here in Kansas, but. I, I can't withhold that little bit of information. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I'd like to just uh, sort of set the stage for today. What I wanted to do was go through sort of a review of what coaches do, but to identify six different um, simple questions that you could use to look at how effective your coaches are and what your coaches are doing. In the past couple of, well, really the past five or six years, we spent a lot of time with different programs. And there are a few simple things that would tell you your coaching program is on the right track or that you have some work to do. So those simple things I've articulated as questions. And these are simple things you could ask a coach about what they do to see how effective they are with what they do. How do the coaches get people on board in the first place? How do you identify what to focus on? Do you have a one-page summary? Have you created checklists for the practices you're sharing? How often do you model? and how do you explore data after observations. And I want to go through each of those questions one by one and then give you a chance to respond in one way or another as we work it. But I think um, the answers to these questions would give you a pretty clear understanding of how effective your coaching program is and whether or not it's going to make a difference for teaching practices and for ultimately student achievement. Uh, there are seven big ideas that I've talked about uh, throughout um, our conversations, and I'd just like to review them quickly and then turn specifically to those questions that I mentioned. The first one is that this idea of partnership, that coaching is an adult-to-adult -adult conversation. And that just means simply that the coach treats the teacher the way any of us would want to be treated if someone was telling us how to do our work. That is, we feel like we're treated like an equal. We have choices in what happens. We have a voice in what happens. We. Um, we are focused on real life activities that matter. And the conversations we have are back and forth. They're not just someone telling me what to do. There's a sense that I have a real input. And ultimately, I feel that the person enters into this conversation expecting they can learn something from me. That it's not all just going in the one direction. And that's that partnership philosophy. That we work with people in ways that um, genuinely respect them as professionals. I think that's a critical thing. The second big idea is that the approach to professional learning is um, focused on a specific number of important high leverage teaching practices. If there isn't clarity and focus on what's going to happen, it will be hard for the coach to accomplish what they have to do. And we'll talk more about that concept as we work our way through today. The third thing is the importance of precise explanations, that the coach has to be able to lay out exactly what this looks like so the other person can clearly see it and um, a lack of precision on the part of the explaining part of coaches um, probably means you won't get implementation. And so we'll talk about specifically how that happens. The follow-up to any kind of professional learning is key and coach, coaching provides that follow-up. That without modeling, not a whole lot will happen in terms of high quality implementation. And then that part of what the coach does is make it easy for teachers to implement. The, Two critical variables for the dissemination of innovations, at least according to some people who study it, are A, that it's powerful, and B, that it's easy to use. Something that's powerful and easy to use is something that's going to spread. And the last thing is the distinction between push versus pull coaching. Pull coaching is where your coaching is pulled along by the concerns of the teacher and their thoughts about what their students need and what they need. Push coaching is where you're trying to get teachers to do something that's good for them and you've made the decision and you're trying to get them to go. And we found that pull coaching is more likely to lead to significant change. So those are the seven big ideas behind this and now I'd like to turn specifically to those questions that would indicate how effective a program is. Um, but before I go there, 
what I'd like you to do is uh, think about the partnership principles, this notion that we would treat people the way we like to be treated, that, that uh, we see adults, professionals as people who can make their own decisions, that we give them choice, that they have a voice in what they do. I was wondering if you could tell me if you, uh, you've heard me talk about this a lot, What's your sense, just generally speaking, do you agree with the partnership principles or disagree with the partnership principles? And you can just give me an X or a check mark on your column there to let me know where you, where you, where you stand on this. You know, I'm not sure if this is time to talk, but I don't think it's as simple as a black and white question. Is that something we could discuss? Well, well I'm not sure. sure. Um, I'm just kind of wondering and thinking out loud then. Um, uh, I, I basically agree that, yeah, we've, we've, we've got to have people to have uh, what their focus is, but sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And so sometimes we've got to bring some ideas in front of them that, that promotes uh, where we think they need to go. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. You might want to put the the mic on mute for a sec. There we go. I agree. I agree com completely that the uh, most professionals who do their work don't really know what it looks like when they do their work, and, and we'll talk through how we approach it. Um, uh, what we do is we gather data on the classroom and share it with the teachers through the use of video, so they can see exactly what happens. Um, I think uh, whatever works, you should do. And so if there's a way of, of moving the school forward that violates the principles, but nonetheless uh, improves instruction and student achievement goes up, I'd, I'd say go for it. Uh, we really just think that the trouble is when you, when you don't take the partnership approach, there's a danger that, um, that you're you're going to engender resistance, and so it actually slows the process down rather than speeding up the process. But, but I think in every situation, it's different. Uh, you, it, one size doesn't fit all. One size fits one. And so there's going to be situations where the teacher says, just tell me what to do, and you do, and you're off to the races. But it, my sense is, based on Edgar Schein's work and our experience with teachers, that if you take the role of being the parent, telling the teacher what you've decided they need to do and you're going to make sure they do it, there's a good chance they might resist. Now, not always in every situation, but that's, that's the thing. And uh, I do agree that um, it's not just a yes or no question. It's that every, every situation is different. But, um, but generally speaking, I think to treat professionals like professionals um, by giving them choice, by letting them have a voice in the process, um, by going into the conversation as, a, as an equal, in my opinion, is the fastest way to get there because it, it, it decreases the likelihood of resistance. Let's. Uh, uh, thanks for clarifying, Jim. And I, and I do. Thanks for clarifying, and I do agree uh, with what you said. And I was kind of thinking more in regards to beginning teachers. So yeah. Well, just to follow up, well, yeah, I think that there's situations where the person says, "Just tell me." And there are situations where you say, I've got to move in and, and, and do something that violates the principles because I think in this case it will make a big difference. Uh, you, you know, we're, it's a dynamic situation when we lead change. And so there are situations where it might not fit. But generally speaking, in the vast majority of cases, we're quick to take the parent role with teachers. And when we do, we run the risk of having them resist because they don't want to be put in a position where they're, they're one down in terms of status. Well, I want to talk through what the coaches do, and we'll pause as we have it here at different times to look at different things, but um, this will get us into our, our six different questions. And the first uh, thing I'd say is that there are many uh, components of coaching, and we'll kind of walk through them pretty quickly because most of you have seen these before. What I really want to focus on is sort of the critical variables in terms of making uh, change happen. Now, when the coach is enrolling teachers, I think they should be doing all of these different things. They should be having one-to-one -one conversations. They should be giving larger small group presentations. They should be working with teachers who are uh, referred to them by the principal. Our coaching should be attached to the workshops 
uh, to the team meetings, to the professional learning communities. That is, if we have a workshop, at the end of it, there should be time for, for teachers to sign up with the coach to implement, because without that follow-up after the workshop, chances are it won't happen. Um, the coaches should be sending out newsletters, <coughs> excuse me, and the coaches should engage in informal interactions that lead to teachers working with them. Uh, basically, they should be doing everything they can think of to get people on board and, and uh, interested in working with them, but still working from the choice perspective. So let's look at the principal referral piece because that would involve most of you and how would that work. In my experience, if the principal says to a teacher, your engagement data is not good enough, you're at 60 percent engagement, every time I go in, time on task is between 60 and 70 percent engagement. We need to get up to at least 90% engagement, and you have to work with the coach. If that happens, in my experience, the teacher goes to the coach and said, or the teacher goes to the coach and said, "Look, uh, the principal wants me to work with you, so come on, fix me. You got 15 minutes." The principal, uh, when they tell the teacher they have no choice, they have to work with the coach. The coach sort of sees that the 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 teacher sort of sees the coach as a punishment. But if the principal says you're at 60% engagement, we've got to get up to 90% engagement, let me give you some options. You can go online. I can give you some websites to go to. I've got a book on instruction that looks at engagement. You can read the book. I've got a video series from the downtown office you can look at on engaging instruction. Or you can work up with the coach. She's a pro at engagement. How you do it is up to you. But somehow, we've got to get that engagement up to 90%. I'm going to work with you. When the principal provides the teacher with, with uh, choices, they're way more inclined to get uh, something beneficial out of the coach because they see the coach not as a punishment but a lifeline. So all of these things need to be going on, one-to-one -one conversations, larger small group presentations, and so forth. But in the heart of that, there's a critical piece, and that's developing a one-page document that the coach can share that says, this is exactly what I'm all about. These are the things I can do. This is a sample from our group of coaches in uh, uh, Beaverton, Oregon, and they enlisted their things under the big four practices of content planning, assessment for learning, instruction, community building. So every time the coach does one of these things, a one-to-one -one conversation, a larger small group presentation, the coach sits down and says, here are the things I can do, and lays this one-page document. And when they do the uh, larger small group presentations, They've got that one-page document that lays out everything that they do. Now, the one-page document that describes all the things the coach can do serves two purposes. One of them is that um, it clearly communicates to the staff exactly what the coach can do. But a more basic purpose of the one-page document is for the coach herself or himself to be clear on what he or she can do. In my experience, when I ask coaches to sit down and write this one-page document that describes all they can do, they often struggle because they're not clear on all the areas in which they can provide support. What are all the things they can do? And if the coach isn't clear on what he or she is going to do, then um, they're not going to be able to communicate it. And um, they're going to waste a lot of time kind of floundering. So for my money, one of the most important things, if you're supervising a coach or working with a coach, this is another example of a one-page document. This is an instructional improvement target, is what we call it. Um, one of the most important things you can ask is, do you have a one-page summary that describes what you do? Our thing is, if it has a staple in it, it doesn't get read. So it's a good idea to have a coach uh, create that kind of document. Um, and what we suggest is, they list all the teaching practices to share with teachers. And they list other information that they wish to communicate about. Maybe they take the partnership approach and so forth, and they can add contact information. But they lay out all the stuff they have to do. So my question to you is, um, right now, as you look at what your coaches do, uh, the first question is, we have two of them. The first question is, do you think your coach uh, has anything like a one-page document that describes what they do? And that would be a little green check mark or a little red X. Check mark for yes, they do, and X for no, they probably don't. So 
So one thing you could do that I think is, and, and what would be really useful is I see a lot of X's coming up, which is exactly what I would have expected, is uh, to, to sit down with the coach and say, let's talk through what are the things you can focus on. That provides the coach with focus, and it makes it much easier to enroll people because they lay out the kind of uh, stuff that they can do. So to me, that's one page your coaches could go, one way coaches could go a lot deeper. The first thing is you, and thank you for doing the little check marks there. The first thing uh, you have to do is get someone to work with. That's the enrolling part, but then you need to identify what you're going to work on. And um, uh, as uh, Will pointed out earlier on, often people don't see their, their needs. It isn't that they can't see the solution. They can't even see that there's a problem. So we've moved to using flip cameras as our way of doing it. We, we videotape the class, and we sit down with the teacher, and we have a conversation with them about what they see. What we found in those situations is <coughs> that the um, teacher usually has absolutely no idea of what's happening in the class. When they watch the tape, they're, they're blown away by what they see. And they're pretty motivated to want to make a change because they can see, well, I had no idea that this was going on or that was going on. And uh, one teacher, for example, said, I stayed up till 2 o'clock redoing all my lesson plans the first time I saw it because I couldn't believe how bored my kids were. But it's um, powerful for them to watch themselves on tape. So to identify what to do, sometimes the teacher comes to us knowing what they want. Sometimes they've been referred by the principal. Sometimes they're in a workshop, and at the end of the workshop, they sign up for coaching. But uh, about half the time, the, there's not a clarity about what they want to focus on. So we have the, the, the coach video records the class. The teacher watches the recording on her own. The coach watches the recording on their own. Then they get together to talk about it and, um, and identify a specific goal they want to accomplish. For us, uh, that goal is around one of the big four practices that you can download on, online at our, our NING. But it doesn't have to be that. If your school is focused on, say, for example, Marizano or uh, Fisher and Fry's gradual release model or whatever it might be, you would try to find a goal that aligns with what the school is focused on. Uh, in the midst of that discussion, then, the coach and teacher try to establish a goal they want to hit. This is to set up what we call pull coaching. So if I'm sitting down with the teacher and she's watched the video, and I might ask a question like, how close is this to your ideal class and what needs to change for it to be closer to your ideal class, the teacher might say, well, my kids just don't look like they're engaged, or there's way too many disruptions, or I don't think the students understand the purpose of the lesson. And so you set a particular goal that targets exactly what you and the teacher are going to accomplish together, driven by what the teacher saw in the video. So that goal might be, I want to get 90% engagement in my class. I'm really committed to doing that. What can we do to make that happen? So um, this is really a question you could ask your coaches. How do you go about identifying goals with teachers? How do you do it? And there's really uh, a question I want to ask you guys with your little green and red check marks there is, um, are your coaches, do they have access to video, flip cameras or other micro cameras that they could use to, to accomplish this, this part of the process, to video tape the classes? How many have access to the video, either a flip camera or some other kind of micro camera? A lot of you do. Now, um, they're, they're not that expensive. They're about $200. So if you, you don't have the, the flip camera, I highly rate Even an iPhone like, uh, has the video capacity to do it. I, I wouldn't get a great big honking movie making video camera because it's too intrusive. But the little flip camera, especially you set it up on a little tripod, it, it captures great video. and. It, it's a really compelling way to help people get a clear picture on what's happening in the, in, the, in the lesson. But anyway, our second question would be, how do you go about identifying goals with teachers? If you're setting up a poll coaching situation, it's one where the teachers have to be at least involved in the process of identifying what they want to work on. We'll move on. Uh, the next thing is explaining what happens. And I really am impressed by Atul Gawande's book, uh, uh, The Checklist Manifesto. It was a, New York Times bestseller, um, which is crazy to think that a book on checklists could actually be on the bestseller list for um, uh, 
I mean, you wouldn't think of checklists as being a riveting topic, but nonetheless, it's really an outstanding book. Because other book, Better, too, is great. Um, just to put in perspective, the potential for that book to make a difference. Um, we had a conference here at, you know, at the University of Kansas, and one of our um, presenters was Michael Pullen, who you may know was a real mentor of mine. And people asked the group, what are two books, uh, our panel uh, members, what are two books you'd recommend that uh, we should le read if we want to understand leading change? And one of the books Michael picked was Atul Gawande's The Checklist Manifesto. So that's high praise from somebody who knows a lot about educational change. One of the things Gawande says is that if we are going to lead change, we have to have precise explanations. Uh, he, in his book, talks about how he did a study with the World Health Organization and found that simple little checklists used during surgery could save thousands of lives and billions of dollars because they clarify what's going on and they lead to precise explanations. And I would argue the same thing should happen with coaches. Your coaches should have precise explanations of the tools they share with teachers. It's the same with athletic coaching. What a good hockey coach does is tell the kids exactly how to do it. This is the way you hold the stick. This is the way you move it when the puck hits it. You give precise explanations, broken it down into tiny steps that the students can follow. The same thing in coaching. I think if you're going to teach a practice, in this case, the checklist you're looking at is just for how to do a pretest as part of an instructional process. If you're going to explain a practice, you should be able to break it down into very clear steps so the person knows exactly what it's about. I've worked with thousands of coaches across Canada and the United States, and I'd say more often than not, the vast majority of the time, the, the coaches could improve their practices just by getting a deeper understanding of the tools they share, by, by creating these precise little checklists that document exactly what it looks like. Here's another example of a checklist for the introductory part of a, a use of a graphic organizer for content planning, where it explains what the teacher does, how long it's going to take, they co-construct a device with the students, and so forth. And then here's one for, <coughs> excuse me, the Q do review process, with, <coughs> excuse me, which um, is the way we use graphic organizers. We name the graphic organizer, explain kids how it's going to help them learn specify what the kids need to do. We walk through the device and so forth, and then we do a review at the end to make sure they've got it. Um, very Madeline Hunter-ish, I guess, but we lay out this example. Now, the, the power of the checklist is twofold. On the one hand, you can make sure that I fully understand the practice and that therefore I can com clearly communicate it, but it gives us a, a, a tool for us to discuss the practices. So, so if I sit down with a teacher to talk about QD review, for example, I say, well, here's what research says. Let me go through it, and then you tell me what you think. Tell me if we need to make any modifications. It becomes a, what Parker Palmer calls a third thing for the conversation. It's not really me talking, and it's, it's really something we go through together. So the two words that capture, whoops, that capture um, the power of, uh, of this explaining part of coaching are precise. I have a really precise document that lays out exactly what it is. But the second word is provisional. When I share it with teachers, I recognize that this might not work perfectly well for their students or their kids. As I said before, one size fits all doesn't work in education. It's one size fits one. And so I might have to adapt things a little bit. For example, with one group of students in the queuing part, the teacher might say, you know, if these kids are going to understand this, this particular graphic organizer, we're going to have to give them some prior knowledge in the queuing part. Let's add that in that we make sure they've got prior knowledge. And in other situations, the teachers may need to make modifications. So the, uh, the way I, I approach it is I always am precise but provisional. One more thought about that is it used to be that I would tell teachers it has to be done exactly the way I say. Let me say it and you do it with fidelity. And when I took that sort of uh, top-down approach, what I found is the teachers would nod their head yes, and then they would just go off and do whatever they wanted to do anyway. So now by saying to the teachers, let me explain it precisely, and you need to tell me if you need to make any modifications. In my experience, teachers are way more inclined to do it the way I say, and if they want to make modifications, we can have a discussion about it right there, right then, rather than have them pretend one thing and do the other. They're going to do whatever they want anyway. 
So we might as well have the conversation out in the open and talk about it before they leave. But the next big question then is this one, have the coaches created checklists? Uh, first thing is, do they know exactly what they're doing? That is, do they have a one-page document that describes what they're doing? Second thing is, um, have they got a way of helping teachers identify what they need to do? And the third thing is, have the coaches created checklists? One last thing about the checklist is sometimes people say, well, isn't that kind of dumbing down what you're doing? Um, uh, and what uh, Tul Gwandi says is, what the checklists do is they take care of the simple stuff so you can focus on the more important things. We can make sure we do the precisely things that have to be done that are precisely described and focus on instruction. So um, I guess the next question I'd ask is, uh, and I know these questions are a little uh, limiting, but um, it's a part of the medium here. Are you, um, I guess, what are your thoughts? Do you think this kind of precise clarity would be helpful to your coaches to do? Would it be helpful for your coaches to create these kinds of checklists? What are your thoughts as you work through? And do any of you have questions about this before you move on to the next piece? So I've got applause and a check mark. That's right. Thank you, Colette. Okay, I'm going to roll along, but please use the chat to make any questions you'd like to make. And, um, and we'll move on to the next thing. To sum up, then, a couple of things. Do they have a one-page document that uh, describes all that they can do, which requires them knowing what they're going to do? Are they gathering data in some way in the classroom ahead of time that would <coughs> enable them and the teacher to identify what to focus on? And the third thing is, have they created checklists for, or at least precise explanations? In some cases, a checklist might, might not work, but in most cases, you want them. Checklists for all the tools that are listed on that one-page summary. I should add that if your coach is a .20 position, uh, it may be that they don't do the video recording in the classroom. They ask the teacher to do the video recording, and they just watch it afterwards. And uh, that's just one way of, of moving things forward. Well, then there's modeling. And, and when we've interviewed teachers, we interviewed 13 different teachers about um, their work with a coach in one school. Uh, what, what we heard in those interviews was, from every person we talked to, was it wasn't until the coach came in and modeled in the classroom that they could actually grasp whatever the practice was that was being learned. Modeling, um, it seems, is absolutely vital. And we know that from instruction. We know that uh, modeling is a big part, part of teaching. Again, if you look at athletic coaching, someone has to show you how to do it, and then you can do it. And in fact, if um, the uh, other parts have been done, that is that we've enrolled the teacher in coaching, uh, we've identified a goal they want to focus on, we've explained it precisely. After the explanation, in most cases, the teacher is going to say, um, you know, it would be really helpful if I could see this. If I could see it, it would be helpful. In my experience, um, if the teacher is just asked, do you want me to come in and model in the classroom without all those other parts happening earlier on, though? Chances are uh, the teacher is going to say uh, either no thanks or yeah, how about all next week because I could stand a break and maybe I'll do some grading while you model. But in both cases, they don't see it as a learning experience. But when all of the pieces have happened and the teacher has a goal they want to focus on and a clear practice they're trying to implement and a clear explanation of it, in most cases, they're going to want the teacher to come in and model in the classroom. So another way to sort of look at what's happened is to ask your coaches how often they're modeling for teachers. Now, just one more thing about this. If your coach has limited time, they could use their own classroom as a setting for modeling, or they could take a day where they model throughout the day and go to different people's classrooms and people come in on their planning time to see what happens. But the ideal scenario, if you have the time, is to do the model lesson right in the teacher's classroom with their kids so they can see, see what it looks like. So um, I've got the 
a question here uh, for your green red check marks and the question is right now um, if you have coaches are your coaches modeling in the classroom as a part of their coaching process and you can give me your little green or red red marks to let me know what, which way it's going if you don't have coaches you can just leave it blank <coughs> uh, any questions about anything that I've said, but in particular the modeling part of this whole process before I move on to the next part? It looks like Steve is typing something in the chat box right now, but just going back, Will made a comment that um, in the previous section about uh, how it, the importance of doing these checklists because we're all at different stages and it helps ensure that the coach and the teacher are on the same page so it really helps with that alignment piece which I think is a great comment. Yeah, I, I, uh, if, again, if you could uh, read me the other comment when it comes up that would be great but in response to Will, what, in the best case scenario you would have a group of coaches who are, who are working on the same things come together prepare the checklist separately and then share what they came up with to make sure they, they've hit the right things. It's amazing how, well, it's, it's kind of hard to describe this, but when you have communication it's like there's this big blob that stands between the speaker and the listener. And what's happening is the speaker isn't particularly clear in her or his mind and the listener isn't really listening all the time. And so when there's a miscommunication, what the speaker is hoping is that the listener will think they don't get it because they weren't listening when in reality it was that I wasn't clear. <laughs> so we can't really make the other person listen, but we can work on the clarity part. We can decrease the likelihood that there'll be a lack of communication just by being really clear. Was there another question, Jen? And just peeking. Yeah, Steve's question in the chat box is, our coaches seem reluctant to model as they specialize on an educational topic such as assessment rather than instructional pedagogy. So the question is, how do we encourage coaches to model or how do we select coaches who are able to model? Okay, um, there's a couple good questions there. Let's talk about the select coaches first. Um, we studied um, the characteristics of outstanding coaches. We did a study in Florida where they had 2,600 coaches and, um, from across the state and from that pool of 26 to help the, 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 the state identified 36 who were outstanding and from that 36 we picked five truly outstanding coaches and there were certain characteristics those outstanding coaches had, had to have. One of them was though that they were comfortable going in the classroom and teaching. They also had to be people who were hard or committed to the whole process. They really believed in the importance of improving instruction and they were learners. They're people who love to learn. And they're people with personal discipline and people with credibility in the eyes of the staff. So um, probably the most important thing you do when it comes to setting up any kind of coaching situation or program is to be careful that you pick people that others would see as people that they'd be comfortable listening to. They're the kind of people who when they speak at a, a team meeting, they might not speak all that much, but when they do, people stop and listen to them. They have to be credible and they have to be comfortable with people teaching. But as far as taking the current coaches and getting them to model more in the classroom, I think um, modeling by itself isn't, isn't the solution though. That we want to be doing all of these things. They have a one-page description they've identified a goal, they're, they've got precise explanations and then when they do the precise explanations it's going to be more natural for them to uh, want to do the modeling or have the, for the teacher to accept them to do the modeling because they've done all that preliminary stuff. But the easiest thing I would say is I'd want the coach who hasn't done modeling and isn't feeling comfortable doing it to find a teacher that they feel really safe with and comfortable with and just to get in and practice it a couple times um, with that one teacher in a sort of low risk situation. That would be a teacher with good classroom management whose kids are uh, responsive and, um, and have them just get in because after they do a couple lessons pretty quickly a coach realizes you know I'm a teacher and this is just what I've always done. It's really no different to do modeling. 
the coaching book, which probably most of you got, has got some good suggestions, I think, from Tricia McHale on what to do, like that you're clear on who's going to be responsible for classroom management, and you, you praise the teacher in the midst of the modeling. But, but the main thing is, I think, that the other stuff has been done, number one, and then that you have the right person, number two, someone who's, who's, they don't have to be the best teacher in the school, but they really do have to be a capable and competent teacher. Um, and so, because they have to go in and model the practices. And, and thirdly, that if they just do it a few times in a pretty low risk situation, I think most teachers will realize this is what I've always done all my life. I've always been a teacher, so it's not, it's not a big deal. I hope that helps. And I like the questions. So, um, moving forward now, and our, our, so far we've talked about a few key things. Number one, have we um, got a clear picture of what we do articulated in this one page document? Number two, are we gathering data in some way so the teacher can focus on a goal that matters to her with respect to her teaching or her kids? Do we have precise explanations of the practices? Do we know those practices really well and can we clearly communicate them? And evidence of that would be the development of checklists. And then are we modeling in the classroom? Are we modeling the practices so that other people can see them? Um, so the next thing is observing, and what we do here, again, is the same as what we did before, that is we, we video record the class. We go in and record the classroom for the teacher, and we, we see what happens. And then um, we, we share the flip, so the question would be do the teachers use flip cameras for operation, uh, observations. But then we have a process we follow when we watch the video with the teachers. What we found is that it's important that the teacher and coach watch the video separately uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, main ones are that um, a person gets more out of it when they don't have another person beside them watching it, plus you're kind of pretty vulnerable the first time you see it. So we suggest that the, the, the video is loaded onto the teacher's computer and it's on the coach's computer, and the coach watches it separately and the teacher watches it separately. Then the coach and teacher get together and they talk about what happened. And the coach asks open-ended questions and listens carefully uh, during the session. Um, most of our video of coaches has shown the coach is doing too much talking. And so the coach has to come in with a few simple questions like, how close is this lesson to what you hoped it would be? And what needs to change to get it to where you want it to go? Or just a simple question like, given the time we've got today, what do we need to focus on? Or, uh, given the checklist we created, where do you think you did well? What do you think you want to work on? And during that session, we think the coach should be, our phrase is, be a witness to the good, be really attentive to what went, went, went well, and want to communicate things that went well when they get together with the teacher. Um, there's two reasons for that. One of them is, um, if you're our natural tendency is to see the things that didn't go well. So we have to train our brain to see what's going effectively. We see the things that don't fit, not the things that are going smoothly. And there's a whole lot of it, uh, writing that by focusing on the positive, it's, it's not a bad thing. What you're doing is you can say, well, you know, when you were working with small groups, the kids were really engaged. What was going on there, and how can we do more of it somewhere else? But you also want the teacher to know that you're on her side. You see her doing things well, and that you're supportive. And if you if, if, for example, the teacher thinks every time I see that coach, she just criticizes me, chances are you're not going to have a pretty positive experience. Then, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the process, by the way, I got this cold I'm coughing. Last time I was in Alberta, and it's still here. So this is a Canadian cold you're here. Anyway, at the end of the process, um, the coach and teacher identify next steps. That is, okay, now that we've seen what happened, uh, here's where we need to go. And um, it's driven by the goals they're both trying to get to. What we found is that if the um, if they identify a goal for students, what's going to happen is although the practice they choose might not work, the goal for students remains, and so they can try something else and try something else. If they identify a goal for uh, a teaching practice, 
let's do the Venn diagram and, and see what happens. They can do the Venn diagram and it might not lead to a change in what students are doing. And so a critical thing is that you identify a student goal, you model it, you record the teacher teaching, and then you explore how well the whole, the whole thing went. What questions do you have about the process as I've described it up to this point? What's still unclear and what are your thoughts about this? And, um, So Jim, I don't know if you can see Will's question in the chat, but I'll just review it for you. He asked, we've worked on lesson study in our school. The time factor means teachers sit down to review a lesson right after teaching it. Is this okay? Yeah, I think that's the way to, way to go. I think the closer you, you can discuss it uh, to the lesson, the better. Um, the one thing is, um, Will, I'm assuming you don't video record the class, is that right? I don't know, I don't know if you do, you do or not, but uh, my thinking my is... So, sorry Jim, yeah, the answer to that is sometimes we do, um, but we don't always review the video because of the time factor. So we may, may review the video later, but not immediately after the lesson. Will, let, let, me, let, let me ask ask one more question. Um, how does it work if it hasn't been videotaped? How does the teacher take it when you do it? How, like, how's the teacher respond? It probably varies, but are they, are they open, are they open to, the to the discussion? discussion? Um, it, it, I think it has worked pretty well. Now, we've spent a lot of time over the last four years doing lots of peer observations. So our teachers are used to people coming in and watching each other. Um, and peer observation is probably you know, a really simple, low-level um, form of coaching and observing um, and then moving to this whole lesson study model which I think has built up some of the safety. Um, yeah, I think there's also then there's the recall factor is how much do we recall if we don't watch the video and I think that could be um, something that's... Uh, but generally the, the outstanding points of the lesson, or yes I noticed, there seems to be common agreement from teachers that yeah I did see that too. My, my, my question would be, um, it's been our experience that the, the teachers don't know what they look like when they teach unless they see it on video. And so while I think everyone else who did the lesson study could benefit from it, I'm not entirely sure how much the, the teacher herself or himself would benefit. Um, but, you know, your experiences would, would tell you what, what's going on. And it sounds like it's pretty profitable, profitable for all members. I do think it's great for everybody else. I described on um, the blog, RadicalLearners.com, and there's the link to the blog, um, a process called Video Study Groups. And that's a little bit different, Will, than what you described. Um, what, the, what the blog is, or what the process is, is that the teachers record themselves teaching. And you have a group of teachers who work together over, a, a, say, a semester. It could be, I don't, know, I don't know, six to ten teachers, something like that. And they're all working on the same thing. Let's say you've adopted a, a video, uh, you, uh, excuse me, you've adopted a vocabulary strategy that you want all the teachers to use, and they're working on it. So you have these, uh, I don't know, sixth grade reading teachers, and they're all, they're all doing vocabulary strategy. They record themselves teaching the strategy, and then they edit the video. <coughs> Excuse me. They edit the video, and then they uh, share it back uh, with uh, their group. And what we found is that the process of watching yourself on video and editing is also a powerful part of the learning. But this group comes together, um, you know, once a month or every couple of weeks. And each teacher, teacher gets a turn to share their excerpt of the lesson to the group, and then they have a conversation about it. Anyway, that process is described on the Radical Learners blog. There's a, a quite a bit of stuff there, actually, on how to use video. Now, I'm reading Sandy's question. At a recent conference I attended, it was suggested that some of the most effective feedback happens during the observation, usually through a series of signals or low-key conversation. I found this to be helpful, supportive, and effective. And I think... Uh, you're on to something there, Sandy. There's, there's a, one of our coaches is studying what they call bug in the ear, where you have a Bluetooth, like a cell phone Bluetooth thing, and you talk to the person while they're, 
while they're teaching. But I haven't uh, honestly got much experience with this. Uh, I think it would de depend on the practice, but I sure think it's potential. And if you've been using it and it's working, I think that's that's really pretty awesome. Um, the way the bug in the air works is as the teacher is doing something, the coach is watching and let's say they ask a particular kind of question and needs a certain kind of follow-up, the coach talks into the ear of the teacher. The hard part, of course, is for the teacher to get used to having a, a voice in their ear as they're teaching, but it's, it's certainly worth pursuing. In fact, if, if this year's NSDC conference, one of our coaches is going to be there to talk about that. All right. Um, so another question is, how do the coaches explore data during coaching? What, how does that take place? And um, <coughs> if it's not taking place, chances are you're not having the kind of impact you'd like your coaches to have. Uh, it, it, it's always messy, this business of coaching, usually because of scheduling. But simple things make a big difference. If you're not observing and providing feedback on what happens, if the teacher is not watching what they do in some way and getting feedback on what happens, there's really not going to be that much growth. It's kind of like the same as being in the classroom. Students have to get feedback on how they're progressing to make, to make the whole thing happen. So let me sort of uh, just add one piece and then kind of revisit the questions and see if you have any questions for me. The last piece in the process is just that you keep it going. Sometimes that means it's more modeling. Sometimes that means it's more explanation. Sometimes that means it's more um, uh, more feedback to the teacher after you've observed the classroom. So it could be any number of different things. If you have a new teacher, probably they're going to like benefit from a lot of modeling. If you're focused on classroom management, it's probably going to be observation and feedback. If you're focused on planning, probably the bulk of your time is going to be spent on explaining. So it really varies, but the goal is to, to provide the support necessary to get the teacher up to being fluent in their use of it. Sometimes the refining and support is just what we have a technical name for it, what's called nagging. <laughs> You're just making sure the person's doing what they said they're going to do. Much like a uh, person who wants to start running might like to have somebody who's kind of an accountability partner. Um, to make it happen. It, it, it's helpful to have someone who, who there actually is research on this that says that it's helpful to have people who, who hold you accountable, who help you do it if it's something you, you want to work on. So let me sum up the things we've talked about and then let me see what, what further questions you have. Um, the first part of coaching is the idea of enrolling the teachers, getting teachers on board for the practice. And we do that through large group or small group implementation or presentations. The most powerful thing is the one-to-one -one conversations with teachers. But the critical thing there is that one-page document. You can identify what you're going to do. Sometimes a teacher comes to you with something they want to do. They say that thing that Allison's doing with sentences, I'd like to do it too. Sometimes it grows out of a, a workshop or a PLC and there's planning where they're going to use the coach. Sometimes they're referred by the principal the way we talked about. Then there's that precise explanation of the tool. Once you've identified a goal, you say, let me, let's go through this in a really critical, critically clear way. And those two words are precise but provisional. The mediation part, we didn't talk much about, but mediate means what you're doing is you're making it fit the teacher's classroom. You're, part of what a coach does is take something and that's, that's uh, set in a certain way and they're tweaking it to make it work in the classroom. Then they model it. When they model it, they bring in a, a copy of the checklist of what it's supposed to look like so the teacher can watch what's happening with the checklist. Then they observe the teacher by recording the teacher on video, and then they sit down and explore what the video shows, and then they refine, refine support. Now, it doesn't always involve video, and it doesn't always involve any of these things. It can be a little bit different every time, but these are sort of the, the big things that we talked about. Now, the questions to ask are these ones right here, and I think if you get good answers to these questions, your coaches are probably uh, probably um, doing a good job. So, uh, call it. I see your question, and I'll, I'll tackle it as soon as I just rattle off these questions. Um, how do you enroll teachers? You want to know what are the coaches doing, and how are they getting people on board? Are they having one-to-one -one conversations? Are they presenting to large groups and small groups? Are they getting referred by you? 
uh, you want to put everything you can into getting people on board in the early process. You, if you don't um, um, have it, the, the chapter on enrolling teachers in instructional coaching lays out lots of strategies you could use. How do you identify what to focus on? Is are they using video? How do they set the goals with teachers of what they want to focus on? And um, in particular, are they using video as a way to observe or gathering data, or how are they doing that? Do you have a one-page summary that describes exactly what you do? Have you created checklists for all the practices you're teaching? How often do you model, and how do you explore data after observations? If the teacher has, coach, excuse me, coach has a one-page summary, if they've created those checklists, if they're usually modeling when it's going on, and if they're frequently getting together to talk about what happened in the classroom after it happened, there's a good chance, um, there's a good chance that, that um, you're making a difference. So we have about six minutes, according to my computer here, for additional questions. What questions do you have about this uh, uh, whole business of putting coaching in place? And I see Michelle's got a question. Some teachers still feel the video. Should we try and be respectful of their wishes or push and make them have the videotaping done? I, I, uh, I'm hesitant to say you should do the push part, Michelle. Um, because it might lead to a lot of other negative uh, side effects, um, that they resist it, uh, they wouldn't want it. But what, there, there's sort of three options for the video. One is that, um, and, and, and I should say too, it, it's not that easy to be videotaped. Almost everybody, the first time they see themselves on tape, um, or a recording, I guess it's not on tape, but um, they just don't like it, and they're not happy with the way they look, they don't like their clothes, they don't like their hair, they want to go on a diet immediately. I mean, I haven't shown video of a person who says, man, I'm better looking than I thought I was. Usually people, they just have to deal with a lot of those kinds of issues. And so, and I often talk to people who say, boy, I wouldn't want to have to watch myself on, on video. So I understand people's hesitancy. But what you can say is, what if I was to record your students but not you. I'll just sit at the front of the class, we'll record the students, and we'll see what they're doing. If the teacher doesn't want herself to be videoed. And if uh, the teacher's not okay with that, you could say, well, what if I was to do a model lesson and you record me and we get a look at your students and we talk about that? Some way to kind of get in there and do it. Now, if you think you could push your teachers to use the video and they would accept it, and it could work positively, I'd say do it, but I'd be really hesitant to go there unless I'm, I'm pretty confident that they're going to be okay with it. All right, Kathy's, Kathleen Murphy House's question is, how can you be an effective coach in an area that is not your area of subject of expertise? I think it depends on what you're sharing with the teacher. If you're sharing classroom management tools, then um, the classroom management is going to be the same whether you're teaching uh, English or trigonometry or Japanese. And so um, there you can teach the classroom management. It, it, it depends on what the tool is. Um, <coughs> our coaches in Beaverton have told us it's actually a bit of an advantage to not be the content expert in some ways because what it does is it means they can elevate the teacher in the partnership and they can put themselves down a bit by saying, okay, you're the expert on your content. I've got the unit planning tool, but you tell me how it works and I'll play the role of being a student and we can work it through. <clears throat> Still, in a high school classroom, you're going to have classes where it would just be impossible for you to model. And so then what I would say is you would co-teach with the teacher. You'd say, I'll, I'll show them how to use a graphic organizer, but you make sure I'm on track with the content. I'm not going to be able to go in and model in trig trigonometry or Japanese, which are about the same for me. Um, I'm going to have to co-teach it with you. But what I would say is the coach probably doesn't have to be an expert in the content area, but the coach does have to be an expert in what they share with teachers. If they're helping teachers with classroom management, or they're helping teachers with effective questions, or they're helping teachers with formative assessment, they need to know what a good assessment looks like. They might not know the content, but they can have, again, checklists that say, when we create these informal assessments, they have to be done like this. 
let's go through it and let me make sure that it, that it works. So um, all that to say is that there's no doubt that having content expertise is helpful in a conversation because you have a, a common denominator with the teacher and if you're really a content expert, you can move the teachers forward in their content knowledge. But the critical thing is that they're experts in what they share with teachers. If their job is to be a content-focused coach, then they need to be experts in content. They're not going to be helpful unless they can do that. But if their, their job is to be an expert in teaching practices, then they need to know those teaching practices and make sure the teachers learn how to use them. That's the distinction I make. All right, I'm reading Michelle's content. Another reason for the coach to have a list of practices they can share with teachers so they, they know they're no longer the agents. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't think the coach, the coach needs to be really careful about what they can and can't do. And that's the idea of focus, that you want to make sure you're focused in on a, on a, a few key things. In the ideal scenario, if you remember on one of my first sessions, the whole school would be clear on what the focus is. That's what I call that instructional improvement target. We've got time for about one more question, if anybody has any other questions. Jim, I just want to go back to something Sandra said. She said at a recent conference she attended, it was suggested that some of the most effective feedback happens during the observation, so usually through a series of signals or low-key conversation, and that she's found this to be helpful, supportive, and effective. So Sandra, I wonder if you want to elaborate on that, or if Jim would like to comment on feedback, providing feedback during the observation itself. Hi. Um, I, what was the suggested was that the closer to the time of observation, the more effective the feedback. And I have been working with, uh, you know, in classrooms with, with some staff, and I found that and when I, it's not with a Bluetooth in the ear, but um, just a series of acknowledgments when things are going, you know, even something as simple as a thumbs up when things are going really well or when you've seen something demonstrated that you were looking for. Um, and you know, if, if students are working and they start working, just a, a one little one little comment, you know, as, as I'm circulating and and she's circulating in the classroom, it, it's um, I find it really reinforcing, and it's just so immediate um, that I tend to see more of what it is I'm wanting to see. Yeah, I really like, I really like that idea. And do you remember who it was that you saw, Sandra, that that, that talked about that? Um, you know, I can I, I can't remember his name. He was he, it was at the um, essentials for uh, for leadership 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 essentials were put on through uh, the ATA the um, administrators um, wing of things and he he was a local actually an Alberta boy um, doctor somebody or other um, <laughs> not being very helpful but he gave the keynote at the end of the uh, at the end of the conference. Well, I'd love to learn more about that. I mean. We talked about the, the, the bug in the air idea with the, the Bluetooth, but um, you know we should get as much out of that time when the teacher's in the classroom. And so what, what, why wouldn't we want to try ways we could communicate during the lesson instead of just sitting there and recording? So if you happen to come up with it, I'd love to hear more about that um, as well. I'd be happy to uh, email the name and uh, the information. Thanks, Sandra. Marina, go ahead. Hi, I attended the same session. His doctor, his name is Dr. Phil McCrae, M-C-R-A-E. Thanks, Marina. Great. Okay, well, I think we've come to our close, Jan. Uh, I hope everybody uh, is having a great year and um, you know keep moving forward. If you haven't got my email, I'm going to type it in right now, and this doesn't have to be the end of our conversations. I'll be back in Alberta quite a bit. Um, there's the email. Just remember, it's Jim Knight, and I use a Mac computer, and you're good to go. But uh, if you want to follow up with any questions or comments, it, it would be great. Jim, 
I just want to say on behalf of all of us, ERLC and all of us in attendance here today, thank you so much for this series um, where you've shared practical wisdom, your support and your resources in mentoring and coaching our instructional coaches. I know it's been most helpful. Yes, let's give him a round of applause, virtual applause by clicking on our applause button. Um, it's been awesome. and. Thank you for your willingness to continue the conversation, sharing your blog and your email. And uh, you know, I would also um, ask folks to consider checking out the blog and providing comments and feedback that way, because that's also a good way to keep the conversation going. So thanks, everybody. Uh, I too hope you're having a great year, and uh, I'm going to ask that you would do a little survey at the end. Yes, Sandra, um, webinars are actually ongoing right now for coaches, but we can look at, um, you know, if you have a request or if there's a need um, for your coaches, we could certainly look at doing something again after Christmas, so we could talk about that. So thanks, everybody.